and welcome to those of you now joining us on YouTube as well. So on the TCF side of things, I want to thank Itasca Bank for sponsoring this webinar. Sponsors like Itasca Bank help us to keep these webinars free for everybody. Contact me for more information on sponsoring. You can also help us to keep these webinars free. After this webinar, you'll be taken to a page with a bunch of resources of things you might be interested in magically through the magic of Zoom. When you close out, there'll be this page there and you'll have our native plant guide, you'll have rain barrel information and so much more, including our virtual tip jar slash membership page. So if you are enjoying these webinars, I do encourage you to donate. That helps TCF continue to do all of the awesome stuff that we do because we do so much more than just webinars. You can also check the box to become a member and then you can enjoy our wide variety of members only stuff. So I will mention it again, just for anybody new who logged in since the beginning, uh, good news, bad news, although it's not really that bad. Webinars are gonna be moving to an evening time slot right? That's what happens to all the good TV shows. They get put in the evening. Uh, we're going to be the first Wednesday of the month at 7 p.m. So next week happens to be the first week of August. So August 4th at 7 p.m. We're going to do kind of a corollary to today's presentation um, of Mad Magnificent Monarchs. So I am going to just nerd out on all things Monarch on August 7th. So please, I hope you will be able to join us. If not, I know not everybody can make every time. Uh, if you can't make that evening time, it will still be recorded and saved on YouTube. So uh, we'll hope you'll be able to join us next Wednesday at 7 p.m. All right. Hey, let's get to talking about some pollinators. All right. So today we are gonna be talking about how to create a pollinator garden or a butterfly garden, kind of the same thing, um, supporting all of our cool pollinator friends. So the first thing we need to know when we're thinking about creating a pollinator garden is what do they need? We wanna give them what they need and they need different things at different stages of their life, right? Just like humans, you know, great, you feed a baby baby food, but you can't just continue to eat baby food throughout your life. You got to start varying your diet and getting new things. So in butterflies, they start out as an egg. And you can see at the tip of that pencil point there, that little cream colored dot, it's actually kind of football shaped if you see it from the side. Um, that is an egg. That is a monarch egg. They are teeny tiny. They're about the size of the head of a pin. So once those hatch, the caterpillar is about a third the size of a grain of rice. They are tiny, 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 tiny little things, but they have two jobs in their life. They eat and they poop. And that's what they do for about two weeks. That little teeny tiny cat caterpillar is gonna do nothing but eat and poop. And in the, that time, he's gonna grow from that third the size of a grain of rice to being a big old monster chunky boy. So they get to be pretty big. Um, maybe not quite the size of my pointer finger, but pretty close. They get to be pretty big. And so after two weeks of eating, they are going to climb off of the food that they're eating because most butterflies, uh, mo most caterpillars are fairly specialized in what they will eat. Um, monarchs, as we're gonna discuss later, only eat milkweed. Um, and we'll talk about what some of the other ones eat later on, but they will crawl oddly to some high point, some point that's, that's going to be away from everything. They can kind of have some privacy and they're going to go into their chrysalis and they're going to be in that chrysalis from about 10 to 14 days. Depends on the species of butterflies. I'm mostly going to be referring to monarchs just because that's what I'm most familiar with, but uh, so at least for monarchs, 10 to 14 days inside that chrysalis, at which point it's going to eclose. That is the terminology we use for when a butterfly comes out of the chrysalis. We call that eclosing. And so that monarch is going to eclose and then hang upside down for a couple of hours. And their wings, when they first come out, are all crumpled and everything's all kind of twisted up and, and wonky. And so they hang upside down so that the wings 
they pump blood into the wings and the gravity kind of helps with that. The wings are going to dry as they're hanging and they're going to like practice pumping and, you know, kind of stretching. He's been cramped up in that little chrysalis for a while. You know, you got to stretch out a little bit. And after a couple of hours, then they're going to go fly off and they may not eat for the first couple of days. But after that, the only thing they're going to eat is nectar, which means they're going to now need a variety of flowers for them to be able to snack on. Whereas the caterpillar was eating one very, very specific thing, the adult usually has a little more variety in what they can eat. So when you are thinking about what to put in your butterfly garden, we wanna support all of these life stages. So having an idea of what are host plants for some of the butterflies in your area as well as what are the nectaring plants. Host plants are what they lay their eggs on, what, they, um, what the caterpillars will eat. Nectaring plants are what the adults will eat, uh, where they can get their nectar from. And we will talk a little bit more about that in a second. All right, so um, you can see, like I said, just a variety of different butterflies, caterpillars, things, um, all different things down there. Um, in the bottom right, that's a morning cloak. Those are absolutely gorgeous. I saw a whole bunch of those up in Wisconsin a few weeks ago. Um, they are just gorgeous. Um, but yeah, that was the first, they're an early butterfly. They, uh, last year, that was the first one I saw in my yard. Long before I saw monarchs or anything like that, we had morning cloaks here. So um, they're a really pretty one to have. So we also want to think about planting through the seasons. And this is just a, a very rough, I, just to kind of give you an idea of what I'm talking about here. When we talk about planting through the seasons, what we mean is we want to have things that bloom very early in the spring, as the earlier the better, all the way through to the fall. So different flowers bloom at different times. And so we want to have enough variety in our yard, not only for ourselves, because, hey, we want to see flowers. And the more flowers you have, the more intentional a garden can look, right? The prettier it is. Um, but we also want to have something for these guys to be eating the whole time they're going through. So having those early spring, sometimes spring ephemerals are good. I love spring ephemerals. They're those weird little woodland plants that come up in you know, April or May, and they're gone by June. Um, all the way through those early summer bloomers, the late summer bloomers, all the way to our asters and other fall blooming things, right? Asters are a fantastic plant to have that they unfortunately can look a little bit weedy throughout the summer, but boy, when fall comes and all those flowers hit, they are a great nectar source for things that are migrating, um, like the monarch, that have to migrate all the way to Mexico. They need food to fuel themselves. And so if we don't have things that bloom in the fall, they're gonna be pretty hungry. So they need a lot of energy to make that big long trip that they make. So having things that bloom for them in the fall is a good way to, to support them on that big journey down to Mexico. Other things to think about for your pollinator garden, you wanna have dark colored rocks in there if you can. Those rocks will soak up the um, solar energy, right? They'll, they'll retain some of that heat from the day so that um, in the morning when the butterflies come out, because they're not warm blooded like we are, they need to sort of warm up with the day. Having a dark colored rock gives them a little bit warmer spot for them to rest and start to warm up so that they can go about their business for the day. Um, having a source for water in there. You want a nice shallow dish so that they're not going to drown unintentionally. Um, so having some rocks, uh, you can see in that example down there at the bottom uh, where they can, they can perch, they can, they can sort of rest there and, and be able to get out of the water. Um, also having sand in there too, that sand will leach out some minerals and some salts, which are like vitamins for them, some things that they need. Um, so you may see that um, butterflies will occasionally be around an animal's head and, and they're actually like drinking the tears. They're getting salt off the, the sweat or the tears 
of that animal. I've, I've actually had butterflies land on my toes when I was wearing sandals and start like licking at my toes. And what they're doing is they're getting those salts. So having sand in your water dish is actually a good thing because like I said, that'll, that'll help to leach out some uh, salts and minerals that they need. Having a sunny spot, right? Sunny spot, A means generally more flowers, but B, it also means a place where they can warm up, like we mentioned in the mornings, um, place that, where they can rest, and then shelter as well. Now, obviously you don't have to have a giant shelter like that for your butterflies, but I just thought that was a really pretty picture. Um, having plants with large leaves, um, having shaded areas, having trees and shrubs, all that provides some shelter for the butterflies get, and, it, and other pollinators. And it just gives them a place to, to rest where they're protected. So these are all different components that you can add to your pollinator garden. So I'm gonna talk an awful lot about using native plants. And I know we have folks joining us from all over the country and that is amazing. I am located in the Chicago region. And so the plants that I'm gonna be mentioning are native to us here. So some of them, we may have some overlap depending on where you're joining us from. Um, however, you're gonna to wanna to find your local native plant society, your local land trust, um, a wild ones chapter in your area, um, some organization that you trust that will tell you what is native to your region. And, the, and there's a reason for that. A, native plants, they're used to your soils. They're used to your climates. We don't have to baby them into thinking that they're someplace else. When we, play, uh, when we plant Japanese this, European that, we have to amend the soils. We have to fertilize a lot. We have to water, especially like now our yards, we have to water them constantly because Kentucky bluegrass, not native to North America at all, despite the name, it, it's actually native to the Middle East, which makes sense that it has that shallow net-like root system on it because that's what you want for holding on to sandy soils. So we want to plant things that are native because they're going to be less time intensive to maintain and much less expensive. Again, you're not dumping a bunch of chemicals on them to maintain them. So you plant all your beautiful native plants there. Well, this is gonna be kind of like that book, if you give a mouse a cookie. If you plant native plants, you're gonna bring in the pollinators. When you bring in the pollinators, they're gonna lay their eggs. When they lay their eggs, you're gonna get caterpillars. When you get caterpillars, you're gonna get birds because birds need caterpillars to feed their babies. So chickadees, like in this picture here, they need just an enormous number of caterpillars to feed their babies. And that's their main food source. They're not feeding seeds. They can feed other insects as well, but think about it. Caterpillars are squishy, right? They're soft bodied. They are nutrient dense. I've heard they have more nutrients than an equivalent piece of beef. So they also are full of lots of um, vitamins and, and, and other compounds that the birds need to make colorful feathers. So if they're not eating bright colored caterpillars, then their feathers won't be as bright. They won't be as successful when it's their turn to mate. So finding and, and, and having a successful mate, especially for males, is dependent sometimes on having these bright, vibrant colors. And they get those by what they eat. And in this case, it's caterpillars. So they're soft bodied. So if you've ever watched a, a parent bird feed the babies, it's really violent, right? They're just kind of cramming those caterpillars in there. And if it's something with pointy ends, like say a grasshopper or a cricket, there's a risk of some damage doing that. So with a caterpillar, it's all soft and squishy. It goes down very easily. So birds need caterpillars. Um, definitely read Doug Tallamy, his book, um, uh, Bringing, Bringing Nature Home. Um, and he's, he's got a couple of books out there, but Doug Tallamy is, is sort of the, the father of the native plant movement. And he's a researcher. He has researched 
birds and their relationship to caterpillars and and having native plants nearby and yeah we got to put more native plants in the ground to help our bird friends and then obviously when we bring in these birds yes we are also going to bring in these birds as well sad but true but it's it's the ecosystem and now your yard is not apart from nature your yard is a part of nature you're helping to support the ecosystems the food chains the, the wildlife, you're helping to provide for everybody in your yard. All right, and so we mentioned that when you plant native plants, they're used to our conditions. So here in the Midwest, we have very heavy clay soils. We have hot, dry summers. We have cool, wet springs, or unlike this spring that was cool and dry, um, we have heavy winters where the ground freezes several inches down, right? Non-native species, look how shallow those roots are. We got to water them all the time to try and make sure that they survive. Whereas with comparable native plants, their roots are going down sometimes 15, 17 feet. So long after those top few inches of soil have dried out, they're still getting plenty of moisture out of the deep soil. They're fine. So they don't mind a drought because they can continue to take care of themselves. The majority of their body, if you will, is underground. So if a fire, for example, goes across the surface here, which wildfire, or not wildfires, but controlled burns are a method of controlling for invasive species. You might see your local forest preserve district um, burn prairie areas, and that's because they're totally used to it. And all those underground root systems, it's, it's basically like taking off a finger, except they can then turn around and regrow that finger pretty quickly. Whereas with the non-native species, boy, you're cutting them right off at the waist, and it's going to be very difficult for them to come back and survive after something like that. So those long roots also help to loosen and improve the soil. As I mentioned, we have very heavy clay soils. These roots will go right through it. They can filter and absorb water. So they're helping to remove toxins. In some cases, some of these plants actually will remove chemicals and other types of pollution from the soils. And they're sustainable. They're long lived. They're perennials. They come back year after year after year without us having to do a whole lot for them. Also having a butterfly garden means less mowing, right? We want to reduce the amount of grass that we have because lawn is the largest irrigated crop in the U.S. Think about that. It doesn't feed anything, right? Really, there's not a whole lot that eats grass. It doesn't, you know, doesn't feed us. It doesn't do anything it's just kind of there, but we put all this time and money and chemicals on it just to maintain lawn. So the less lawn that you have, the less mowing you have to do. So this little plot here, um, this is a, a park district owned property. Uh, it's right at a trail intersection and it had been grass and the park district would have to bring their mower out about once a week or so and mow that little strip. Kind of silly. So we talked to them about putting native plants there instead. Now they don't have to mow it at all, maybe once a year to help keep the weeds down in there, but that actually saves them money because they don't have to pay guys to drag the lawnmowers out here, mow just that little bit and then go on to their next thing. So it, it actually saves money and time. In your home, in your yard, the less lawn you have, the less you have to take care of. And honestly, the prettier it's gonna be. I have seen people who have basically removed all of their lawn and replaced it with native flowers, native grasses, low growing things. I mean, come on, we're in the suburbs, let's get real. Not everybody can have full prairie in their front yard, but, you can do it in such a way that it still looks attractive and is still acceptable in our suburban areas. 
All right, let's talk about some of our specific pollinators that we have here. Obviously, I like to talk about monarchs. They are my favorite. Um, not that I you know, can pick a favorite child, but, um, and remember, join us next week, 7 p.m., where I get to totally geek out and tell you all these fa fabulous facts about monarchs. Um, but for today, what we need to know about monarchs is they need milkweed. And there are a large number of different kinds of milkweed all over. You're gonna wanna get ones that are native to your area. Now, depends on how specific you wanna get with native. Some people think as long as it exists in your state, you're good. In here in Illinois, Northern Illinois is very different from Southern Illinois. And there are some things in Southern Illinois that are native that don't do so well up here in Northern Illinois. So some people like to go by county, it's up to you. It's, it's what you wanna put in your garden, right? It's, it's gotta make you happy. So um, there's three main types that I talk about uh, for home yards. Uh, the first one is common milkweed. You gotta be really careful with common milkweed because common milkweed gets like seven feet tall. It's really big. It can get kind of floppy. Um, people think it can look weedy sometimes and it spreads via rhizomes, which means if you plant one next year, you'll have three and so on. So you need to be careful where you plant this. It, you need to make sure it's in an area that can handle something that big. Now, you can always cut it back. That helps to keep it a little bit shorter. But if we're going for low maintenance, it's not always the best choice. I will say that little globular cluster of flowers that are there smell like some of the most heavenly perfume you have ever smelled in your life. Um, these are frequently seen growing on roadsides or adjacent to farm fields. Um, they're just, they're kind of everywhere. Very easy to get seeds for. Um, milkweed can be difficult to grow from seed because it's got to go through a freeze-thaw cycle, um, which means a lot of times planting them in the snow for best germination. All right. Um, secondly, so common milkweed, that's that one there kind of in the top middle. In the top right, that's swamp milkweed. Swamp milkweed grows up to maybe about hip height. It's got much narrower lance-shaped leaves on it. Still has those sort of pinky purpley flowers on them. Very pretty. Despite the name, it does not have to grow like in water. It can grow in, in a pretty wide range of soil moisture conditions, ranging from pretty moist all the way to uh, what they call music, which is that right in the middle to dry music, I think you can even get away with. Um, so wide range of soil conditions for that one. It's a really nice addition to a yard uh, garden. And then bottom right, that's butterfly weed. That is by far, in my opinion, one of the most gorgeous things you can add to your home gardens. Um, just overall, despite the fact that it benefits um, the pollinators. Um, butterfly weed grows up to maybe knee high if it's really happy. If it's really happy, it'll get kind of shrubby like too. Um, and it just, those orange flowers on it are just absolutely gorgeous. Bottom middle there, um, that is green milkweed. That's a less common one, a little bit trickier to find. Um, I've also recently discovered Sullivan's milkweed which is also native here. Um, it's sort of like a cross between um, swamp and common, I think, um, or maybe green and swamp. Anyway, it's um, the leaves on it are a little bit bigger, a little bit rounder than swamp, um, but it doesn't get quite as tall as common. Real pretty, uh, real pretty type of milkweed there. All right, black swallowtails. These guys like things that are in the carrot or dill family. So fennel, wild carrot or Queen Anne's lace, um, like I said, dill, fennel, all of those kinds of, basically, uh, oh, parsley, that's another one that they like. Um, <clears throat> they, are, they are another absolutely gorgeous one. I've raised a couple of these guys. They're kind of funny. If you bug them a little bit, you know, kind of like gently poke at them, they get annoyed and they have um, something called an os osmetrium, osmeterium, I always forget how to say that, but it's like this orange thing that pokes out from their forehead and it's just like, hey, knock it off, you're annoying me. And I think it's supposed to mimic a uh, snake's tongue, 
but it's just kind of a little funny thing that they do. But um, so I plant dill in my garden, even though I don't really use it for very much. I still leave plenty of dill in my garden. It reseeds itself pretty easily. It doesn't get in the way of anything. Um, and it's great for these swallowtails. So pearl crescent, I thought I would throw this little less common one in here. Um, they feed on asters. So they eat all the asters. Um, anything in that little family. They're a very small butterfly. Um, I know in the picture, it's kind of hard to tell. There's really nothing for scale there, but that entire butterfly might fit on one of the monarch's wings. So they are a smaller butterfly um, in the crescent family um, and they like their asters. And there's really an aster for just about every occasion. As I mentioned earlier, they are a great fall blooming plant to help give your garden color going into the fall. Um, they, you know, produce just these great big sprays and, and depending on what your soil conditions are like, there is an aster that will fit in there. I remember when I was in grad school, uh, we had a project where we were supposed to find plants from like 15 different families and it seemed like every flower I came up with was in the Asteraceae family. There are hundreds of thousands of members of this family. So um, asters are, are very easy to find and easy to grow and um, you can find an aster that will fit your conditions. All right, tiger swallowtails. These are a great one too. Look, I just love how weird their caterpillars look, right? Um, but I wanted to throw this one in here because their host plant are actually trees. And we don't often think about trees as being a host plant, but they like apples, maples, cherries, oaks. Um, that's what their caterpillars will eat. And because they are up in the trees, we don't really see them all that often, which is a shame because I really wanna see a tiger swallowtail caterpillar. Um, but you see how different those two look there. That's a male and a female. So this is one where the males and females look drastically different from each other, unlike the other ones that we've seen just now. Um, so kind of easy to confuse um, the tiger swallowtail with a black swallowtail, I think. They look kind of similar, so um, they can be a little bit tricky to tell apart. But this is why having native trees are so important to our landscape. So when you're thinking about native plants to put into your yard, you wanna make sure you're thinking about trees and shrubs as well as flowers and grasses. Flowers kind of, flowers get all the love, but the real workhorses are our trees and shrubs and our grasses too. And oh my goodness, so many moths. Um, moths make up to 90% of the Lepidoptera family. That's the family that includes butterflies. So in that entire family, only 10% of it is the butterflies, but it's the butterflies we all know and love because they're so pretty, they're out during the day. Um, many moths, because they are out at night, we either don't see them, they're not terribly pretty, you know, they don't have those bright colors because they're not out in the day, so who cares? Um, but, you know, rosy maple moths, I've seen those before, they're absolutely gorgeous. Just such an adorable little moth. Hummingbird moths, we do see those out during the day. Um, I get those visiting my native plants all the time. And it, you truly think it is a hummingbird. It is humongous. It is just an absolutely giant. It's hard to even call it a moth, even though it is because it's just so big. Um, and those really cool clear wings that they have, sometimes called a clear wing moth as well. Um, but yeah, they're super cool. Now the Isabella tiger moth, you may not have seen before, but I guarantee you've seen their caterpillars. Um, if you have ever seen, maybe as a kid, the woolly bear caterpillars, those little brown and orange caterpillars that supposedly tell you how severe the winter is gonna be, for some reason they come out in the fall and they are just everywhere in the fall. Well, those woolly bear caterpillars turn into that Isabella tiger moth. So. It's kind of funny because it's not something I ever thought about before. You just see the caterpillars and you just think of it as the caterpillar, but that's only the beginning of its life because then it turns into that Isabella tiger moth. And then we got Luna moths and Cecropias. Those are the really big ones. Those guys get, you know, several inches across on their wings. And if you see those, that is a good day. 
Um, they, you, you don't see them often. Um, I know people who have raised them before, but they are just an absolutely gigantic moth. And I think they're fairly pretty too. Look at those eye spots on that Luna moth, right? Those are just so cool. I love those. All right. And then we also, since we are talking about not just birds and butterflies, we also have to talk about bees. I get a lot of questions. People are concerned. Well, if I plant native plants, does that mean I'm going to bring in bees? Because I do not want to get stung. I'm here to tell you, don't worry. Native bees, some of them don't even have stingers. Um, there are four to 500 species of native bees. Honeybees are not native. Honeybees come from Europe. Um, mostly Italy, most of the bees that come around here, and they are an agricultural animal, just like pigs and cows and sheep. So they are an introduced pollinator. Um, and obviously they're introduced so that they can make honey for us, they can pollinate crops, but our native bees actually do an excellent job of pollination as well. And in some cases, honeybees are starting to crowd out some of our native pollinators. So honeybees, we all know they live in a big hive and they've got a queen and there's the whole colony there. Many of our native bees are what are called solitary bees and they don't have a big hive to defend. So they're not particularly aggressive. So you really have to try to get stung by them. Like you have to grab them or step on them. Neither of which I recommend, by the way, um, you really have to, to try to get stung by them. They're not gonna bother you just walking by or you know, walking through the garden they're going to leave you alone because bees, their stinger is shaped kind of like a fish hook. It's got a barb on the end of it. So when bees sting, part of their abdomen actually gets ripped out along with the stinger and it kills them. They know this. So it's really a, a last defense for them. Wasps, on the other hand, uh, like that yellow jacket that you see, uh, their stinger is more like a hypodermic needle. They can sting over and over and over and over again and fly away laughing, which I swear they do. Um, so they are much more likely to sting. However, wasps tend to be more carnivores. Um, the yellow jackets are the one when you're having a picnic outside. They're the ones trying to get into your pop can. They're the one going after your bologna sandwich. They're the one flying around the garbage can and hanging out there. They are actually more likely to sting you than a bee, especially in the fall. And there's a whole article I've read recently about why they get more aggressive in the fall. It's super interesting. I won't go into it here, but look it up if you're interested because it, it's actually a really cool phenomenon. Anyway, so native bees are good in summary. They are very important pollinators. Um, moths and butterflies can't do it alone, right? These guys are very important pollinators as well, um, but they are very unlikely to sting unless, you know, you accidentally grab them or something like that. So how do you get started in your home garden? What do you do? Well, you don't have to create a whole new garden and completely start over. You can if you want to, that's a great way to do it. You don't have to. But the five families that are listed here, according to Doug Tallamy, support over three quarters of all insect life here in, in our region. So the Rudbeckias, the Black-Eyed Susans, the Solidagos, the Goldenrods, the Symphotrichum asters, the Asclepius milkweeds, or the Oaks Quercus, right? All of these plants, this is a good place to start. Something, you know, there's lots of different individuals within each of these genus, but this is where you want to start. So golden rods can be a little bit tricky. I kind of try to stay away from those just because they can get a little out of control in a garden. Some species are better than others. Um, just like we mentioned with milkweeds, some milkweeds are better than others for a home garden. Um, out in a prairie, they're great. Um, oak trees, if you're looking to replace a tree, maybe you lost an ash tree. Um, maybe, you know, in storms you'll lose something and you're looking for a new tree to put in. Oaks 
always, always oaks. There's an oak for every condition and, and they are a very important part of our ecosystem here. And you can just add them to your existing landscaping, you know, whether it's swapping out a hosta for a little patch of butterfly weed um, or adding in some native grasses in between your existing daylilies. Um, Blazing Star or Liatris, there you see at the bottom, that is an absolute pollinator magnet. Definitely, definitely recommend that to anybody putting in a pollinator garden because it, it just, mine is covered constantly with pollinators. Coreopsis is a great one too. Real pretty striking yellowy orange flowers there. Um, the butterfly weed, obviously we mentioned milk, uh, milkweeds for monarchs. So butterfly weed's a great one to put in there. Um, I, I have yarrow in here. I need to, to swap that one out. I've recently learned yarrow is not exactly native here. It's naturalized. It's not a bad choice. It, it is not invasive, but it's not true native if that's what you're going for. Let me tell you, it was a whole rabbit hole I went down learning that one um, because arguments go back and forth on it a lot. But I think the consensus at this point is yarrow is not native, but the pollinators do like it. It's not a terrible choice. Uh, cardinal flower is a great, great native, just that so few things are that bright striking red. Um, it, it is really pretty show-stopping when it blooms. Um, and the hummingbirds actually like cardinal flower too. Um, spice bush is a great shrub to add. Uh, there is a particular swallowtail called the spice bush swallowtail that that is its host plant. Um, very pretty coloring in the fall. Um, so definitely, definitely a recommended one here as well. So we have our conservation at home program through the Conservation Foundation. If you are located in Kane, Kendall, DuPage, or Will counties, contact me and, and I can hook you up with a yard visit. Um, through our conservation at home program, it's a free consultation with one of our staff, such as myself, and we'll walk around your yard with you and talk about what you've got going on, what your goals for your yard are, and make some recommendations on native plants that you could add to your landscaping. If you are outside of that area, you're not totally out of luck. We do have a couple of franchisees in other areas. Again, drop me a note. I can let you know if we have one nearby. If not, you can, as I mentioned earlier, contact your local land trust. Uh, the website is findalandtrust.org. You can find your own local land trust. And many times they are happy to talk to homeowners about native plants that they can add to their landscaping. Um, there are lots of other resources out there too for landscaping. So, um, and I put these two pictures in here just as an, a, a suggestion that there are as many design styles as there are people on the planet. So you might like that nice, neat suburban look to your landscape beds or maybe you want it to be a little more wild and free like the one on the right. Um, you know, that's a great design for the backyard, especially because you got a little more space usually and honestly, you know, fewer people that complain. But, you know, you know your neighborhood and I would love to see it being more normalized to have lots of native plants in your landscaping. Take for example, this library, they were redoing the library and they had these great windows and they put chairs in front of the windows and they couldn't figure out why nobody wanted to sit in the chairs. Well, who wants to look at this brown desert? Instead, we consulted with them and they put in this gorgeous native plant bed. And now there was basically a line of people waiting to use the chairs because they've got birds flitting around in there, butterflies, bees. It is just teeming with life. And now there's actually stuff to look at. So talk about natural inspiration. If you are looking to get involved with the Conservation Foundation, there's a number of ways you can get involved with us. As I mentioned, you can get your yard certified. You can become a member. Um, you can take part. We've got youth programs that we do all summer long, um, as well as our school programs. Uh, schools come out to our farm for field trips all the time. You can visit our McDonald Farm in Naperville or our Dixon Merced Farm in Montgomery. Uh, the Dixon Merce Farm is more of a historic farm. They do all kinds of events out there uh, that, that 
people can take part in, learn about historic farming. We've got some restored farm buildings out there. It's really cool. Um, at our McDonald farm, we've got examples of solar, of uh, wind turbines. We use a cistern because we are an actual farm. We're a working farm. We've got uh, 60 acres and 49 of those acres are farmed organically. Um, we've also got pollinator gardens, rain gardens, restored prairie. We got all kinds of stuff out there. It's a great, great place to work. Oh, we also have a children's garden out there too that looks gorgeous. We also do rain barrel sales, plant sales. Uh, this fall, we will have our tree and shrub sale coming up. So stay tuned for those as well. And with that, I will take some questions. That's my contact information there. Uh, email is the easiest way to reach me if you have any questions after this, if I don't get to your question. If you think of your question 10 minutes after we log off, that's fine. You can drop me an email there. Or if you just want more information about any of the things that we talked about today. All right, so with that, I'm going to stop my share. All right, and let's get to some questions. All right, uh, Danelle says, I tend to broadcast my flower seeds willy-nilly in a flower bed. I see other people plant in clumps. Is there a way that is better than another? Great question. And the answer is no. The answer is whatever works for you and your garden. Um, if you have more of that prairie look, that wild and free example that we had on there, casting seeds about, honestly, these guys are going to find where they're happy to be anyway. So, you know, we kind of joke about native plants walking and you can design your garden however you want, but the plants have a tendency to move where they want to be. So that's kind of how, how it goes there. So, yeah, so there, there's no one way that's, that's better. It's whatever works for you and your garden. Uh, is it better to collect seeds in the fall and broadcast them in the spring? Should I mow my bed down or leave it to reseed? Okay, great questions there too. Um, so collecting seeds is great if you want if you want to reuse them. It's going to depend, planting is going to depend on the specific plant. There are lots of different things that may be needed. For example, I mentioned with milkweed seeds. Milkweed seed is is kind of hard sometimes to start because it's got to go through that freeze thaw cycle. It's got a thick seed coat on it and it needs that freeze thaw, just like how um, you know freezing and thawing will crack concrete. It breaks open that seed coat so that the seed can germinate. So um, it, it, it needs that freeze thaw. So some people will uh, do what's called snow sowing, which means when you got like an inch or two of snow on the ground, you drop the seeds on there and kind of do a little dance on top of them and let them germinate that way. Um, so especially with native seeds, sometimes it, it's actually better to spread them in the fall, which is what they would normally go through. You wanna try and, and replicate those natural conditions for them. But whatever plants you're looking at, you may wanna read up on that. Um, because there, there's lots of different methods. You can do that, um, they call that stratifying. You can do that stratifying in the refrigerator, in moist sand. You can, um, sometimes they require what's called scarification, which means actually taking sandpaper and rubbing sandpaper over the top of the seeds. And that helps to break open the seed coat. There, there's lots of different ways to do it. So um, best to read up on what plants you've got going there. All right, Jane says, I've been pulling my Queen Anne's lace because it's not native. That's correct. It is not native. It was brought here from Europe. Um, it's, and it does get pretty weedy. Um, you know, of all of the, you know, non-native things that are here, it's, it's pretty weedy. So yes, it does feed the caterpillars, but probably not something you want in your yard. There's plenty of it in the roadside ditches. Sandy wants to know which is male in the tiger swallowtails. Uh, the yellow one is the male and the black one is the female. Uh, Kathy says, I have lots of white cabbage butterflies. What plants are attracting them? I don't grow cabbage. Um, you may not be, but others may be. Remember, the cabbage in this case is their host plant. That's what the caterpillars are eating. Um, so whether neighbors are planting and, and that cabbage family, that Brassica oleracea family, is we have done so much to that poor plant. 
Um, so things that, that are that species, Brassica oleracea, that we have bred differently include cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, um, Brussels sprouts, and it, it's, it's just all the different parts of the plant that we've selected for. So they're all part of that same family and those cabbage white butterflies, their caterpillars will eat it all. So if you're growing broccoli, they'll eat that. Or if you're growing kale or your neighbor's growing kale, you know, they'll, they'll eat all of that. So um, the adults on the other hand, they're going after the flowers. So whatever flowers you have that, that their mouth parts can fit on, you know, that's what they'll, that's what they'll eat. All right, Jane says, thankfully I have goldenrod, asters, brown-eyed Susans, pearly everlasting, dogbane, all volunteers. Oh, lucky you, lucky you. Should I be adding other varieties of some of these or just go with the flow? Personal choice. If you wanna just cultivate those things that you have growing there, oh, especially that pearly everlasting, I love that. Um, by all means, you can, if you wanna start adding new things to it, diversity is great right? The more diverse things are, the better it is. Um, you know, that, that holds for all communities. The more diversity we have, the more things we will support. So um, you've got a great start, but, you know, my favorite thing to do is go flipping through the Prairie Moon catalog and going, got it, got it, need it, need it, got it, need it. So uh, whatever, whatever you feel like adding to that, that sounds great. The one thing I will mention though, you say you have dog bane, that will take over. So be careful with your dog bane. Um, that that tends to get everywhere. I I just removed a whole bunch of it at a work day on Saturday. So it yeah it can go kind of crazy. So watch out for that one. All right, Denise says I have a terrible time overwintering butterfly weed here in Lake County. I usually have to start from scratch with new plants every spring. Any suggestions? Uh, well, I would say. For whatever reason, butterfly weed does not like that soil. So try something different. Maybe try swamp milkweed. Maybe it's too wet. Maybe it's too shady. I That plant is telling you it doesn't like your soil for some reason. Um, I jokingly refer to, to a thing I call soil ghosts that sometimes you have, by all descriptions, should be the perfect habitat for that plant and it just will not grow. And there are other times it should be the exact wrong habitat for that plant and it thrives and looks great. Why? Soil ghosts, I don't know. So um, your soil ghosts are apparently wrong for butterfly weed there. So I, I would try something different, you know, see if you could put it in another spot in your yard um, or butterfly weeds, one of those, I think it even may work in a, uh, in a container you might be able to overwinter it in the garage in a container. You could try that. Um, otherwise, yeah, it just doesn't want to be there for some reason. I cannot grow coneflowers in my yard. I have tried coneflowers in a number of areas. First year I had a huge patch of them. The next year I had two. They just don't like my yard for some reason. Um, how do we get a hold of someone to come out to our home in Will County? What's the contact info? Hey, Will County, hi. I'm your contact info. I'm the one that will come out to your yard. So drop me an email. I will put my email back in the chat for you um, and drop me an email and we'll talk. I have the longest email in the world though. It is jvbach at theconservationfoundation.org. So yeah, drop me a line and let's talk. Hi, Terrence. My friend Terrence in Louisiana uh, said the butterflies love his fig tree. Now his fig tree is wild and free. It's taking over the yard, but he gets beautiful giant zebra swallowtail butterflies. Oh, I am so jealous. I don't think fig trees work too well up here in Illinois, but man, I would love to see that. We don't get zebra swallowtails up here. I don't think we get giant swallowtails on occasion. I don't think I've ever seen a zebra swallowtail though, but that's awesome. I am very jealous. Lynn says, monarchs love my butterfly bushes. Are they considered native? All right. Butterfly bushes are not native and are actually kind of invasive. So that is one that we actually do not recommend. Um, if, 
if it's truly what's being called butterfly bush. There are sometimes people will refer to butterfly weed as butterfly bush. It's common names, you know, what are you gonna do? Um, but if it is truly butterfly bush, that is not a native one and it's not really one that we recommend. Um, there are just better choices for it. Oh, Karen, the mosquito question. If my city sprays for mosquitoes, does the spray hurt my pollinators? Yes, the, the, the answer is yes. I, oh, mosquito spraying drives me absolutely crazy because A, it's safety theater. It does not work. People think it works. People see the city doing something about mosquitoes and they're happy. The problem is it doesn't really do what they say it does. So it may get the ones that are flying around at that point in time. It also can hurt other things. They say they only spray at night when bees and butterflies are down and that helps, but it's not the answer. It's, it's just not the answer. And, and it does nothing to the mosquito larva that are coming up. So spraying your yard for mosquitoes works like maybe a little bit in that instance, but as soon as the spray is down, the mosquitoes are gonna come from everywhere else and that's, that's it. So my recommendation, if you are looking for something to do for mosquitoes in your yard, take a five gallon bucket, add water, add straw, and add a mosquito dunk. Okay, so they're, they're just called dunks and you put it in the water there, the, it draws the mosquitoes in, only the mosquitoes, they lay their eggs and, and their larvae are then killed by what's in that dunk. It doesn't get on the surrounding plants. It doesn't affect butterflies. It doesn't affect bees. It doesn't affect anything else. So those mosquito dunks are the way to go to help for mosquitoes. The other thing you can do is again, planting natives and planting things that are going to encourage birds, bats, and dragonflies. Dragonflies are like the number one predator of mosquitoes besides bats. So dragonflies are really a great thing to see. They are like little fighter jets going around getting mosquitoes. And even in their larval stage, dragonflies larval stage is in the water, their larval stage eat larval mosquitoes. So dragonflies are my favorite solution to the mosquito problem, but please don't get your yard sprayed for mosquitoes and, and really encourage your city to stop spraying for mosquitoes. It just doesn't work. All right off my soapbox. Um, all right, uh, thoughts on putting in beehives versus attracting native bees naturally. Okay, so I'm assuming by beehives, you're talking about honey beehives. Uh, those are a lot of work and they're okay. We just did a webinar on beekeeping, um, but it, it's, a, it's a completely different story with attracting native bees. By, by putting in native plants, you're gonna support the, hum the honeybees, but you're also gonna support all the native bees as well. Unless you're talking about the little bee houses that they put up, there can be some issues with those. You gotta keep them clean. I've heard kind of both, I've heard it both ways about whether they're good or not. Um, so read up and kind of decide for yourself on whether that's, that's something you wanna do. Planting native plants is the easiest way you can support our native bees and our native pollinators. That, that's all you gotta do. You don't have to care for them beyond that. When you put up the bee houses, you gotta make sure you clean them out to, to remove any um, parasites or remove any um, diseases that can accumulate in there. Um, and it's it can be a lot more work. Native plants are, are really your best way to go. All right, well, deer eat the native plants you talked about today. Deer, in my experience, will eat just about anything. Sometimes they will try it once and not try it again, um, but you know, then they've tried it. There are some things that they absolutely love. Um, the, the general adage in all of this is to plant for everyone. So plant a little bit extra with the idea that the deer are gonna eat some and then you'll have some to enjoy as well. Um, I have yet to meet anything that is truly deer or rabbit resistant even some of the exotic things, it, you know, it's just, it's just kind of how it goes. 
Um, you just kind of have to put them in and try them. I tried putting in a trillium in my yard and the very next night the deer came and just ate it. And there was just a hole left in the ground where I had planted it. So now I know if I'm gonna plant trillium again, I gotta cover it. I gotta do something to help protect it, at least while it's getting established. All right, um, let's see. I know we're kind of running out of time here. Let's see, I'm in Florida and have common milkweed, but lately I have leaves turning yellow and I've been pulling them off. We've had a lot of rain. That can be the cause of it. So when they turn yellow like that, the term for that is chlorosis. Um, and chlorosis just means the leaves are turning yellow. Um, and there are many causes for chlorosis. There is something called aster yellows that the plants can get um, where the whole plant will turn yellow. And unfortunately in that case, it's a disease, it exists in the soil. You just have to dig it up and not plant more of that kind of plant there. Um, you gotta put something else out there um, because of the disease in the soil, it'll just keep coming back and spread. I'm not saying that's what happened in your case. It sounds like maybe the water might be the cause of it, um, but just something to keep an eye out. If you see, you know, if you have a whole stand of green ones and two of them are yellow, that's a sign that it could be this aster yellows. All right, uh, Melissa says, I work at a county farm bureau and wanting to put in a pollinator and or butterfly garden. Is there any programs that can help with this in Southern Illinois? This will be for ag education also. Ooh, that's a great question. Um, I'm not super familiar with what's available in Southern Illinois. Um, I know up here there are often grants for things. Um, I would have to look into that. Melissa, send me an email and I will see what I can do about finding um, some grants for you because I know they are out there up here, but I can ask around and see if anybody knows of anything in Southern Illinois. So send me an email and I'll, I'll see what I can do for you. Uh, let's see, Joseph says, should I get the soil in my garden analyzed, pH, et cetera, to know what plants to plant? If you are putting in a garden, Joseph, yes. If, however, you are putting in native plants, know that the soil in your yard is already good for them. That's, that's what it is. That's the cool thing about native plants. They don't care how much clay you have in there. You don't need to amend it. You really shouldn't amend it um, because if the soil is too rich, the native plants will get leggy and, and, and they don't like it. So they're used to what our soils are. So whatever soil is in your yard, if you get things that are native to your yard, it's all good. So if you're putting in a garden, then yeah, you definitely need to know pH and, and all of that. But you know, if you really wanna know more about your soil, you can do, there's something cool called a jar test. And you just take a scoop of soil, put it in a jar with some water, give it a really good shake and let it sit for like a week. And you'll see the different layers settle out and so you can see what the components of your soil are that's in this case it's really more just for general knowledge um, but you get plants that are native to your area and your soil will be fine uh, lynn says i have wild or native tall skinny american asters growing they look like weeds but i was told today by a nature center worker they will have small flowers in the fall should i leave them or pull them out they look like really tall spindly weeds are they beneficial to any birds and or butterflies all right so if they are asters then yes, they are beneficial. Like we mentioned that Pearl Crescent, that's one of their host plants. The flowers are great fall uh, fuel sources for those pollinators. But yeah, I know what you mean. Asters in the summer can definitely look kind of weedy. One of the things you can do to combat that is you can actually cut them back. So as they grow up, as they start getting kind of weedy, cut about a third of the plant off. All right, in you know June, July, probably not, it might be too late by now, but you can definitely do it in like late June, early July. You can cut part of the plant off and that will encourage more lateral growth instead of the big, tall, skinny kind of thing. And you won't hurt the buds because the buds won't be there yet. So um, to answer your question, leaving them or pulling them out, that's up to you. So I am very of a Marie Kondo mindset in my garden in that if it does not bring you joy, if you look at it and it's just a constant annoyance, get rid of it. Native or not, get rid of it. If you don't like it, it's your yard. Your yard should make you happy. Doesn't make you happy, pull it out. You have my permission. Not that you need it, but sometimes when I say that, people are like, oh my gosh, thank you. So there you go. If you want it, you have my permission to pull it out. Um, or you can try some of these other methods to keep it from looking quite so weedy. Uh, let's see. What 
else we have? Uh, is basil a pollinator? It attracts butterflies in my yard. So basil, yeah, basil has flowers on it and it will definitely get, it, it's in uh, the mint family, I believe. And everything in the mint family just attracts pollinators like crazy. It's not native, but again, it feeds us. I have tons of basil growing in my yard. And yeah, I, I try not to let my basil flower though, because it makes better, um, the leaves are better for eating. But when it does flower, yeah, it's got pollinators all over it. Uh, let's see what else we got. Um, all right, Kathy says, I thought bee balm was a native and butterf butterfly friendly. Yes, it absolutely is. Bee balm, also called, um, uh, what's the other name? Monarda is another name for it. Uh, yes, is is also in the mint family, interestingly enough. That's another one of those huge, gigantic uh, plant families. Um, but yes, so it is native, definitely butterfly bee friendly. I didn't mention it today. I, I, there's a hundred other plants I could have mentioned that I didn't, but they're all very good. And yes, echinacea, all good. Yep. Uh, the one thing to watch out for, especially when it comes to your echinacea uh, or your um, coneflowers, are watch out for nativars. So a nativar is a cultivar of a native species. And cultivars can be kind of tricky. So we have changed them from their wild type, which is the native state. Um, they're... I, change so that the flower looks different, the color looks different, the shape is different, like lots of different things for it just because we like it that way. Um, and what happens is when we change that, all of a sudden it becomes somewhat unrecognizable to the insects. And so you'll find less insect activity on cultivars than you will on actual wild type native plants. So all that to say, when you can, make sure you stick with pale purple coneflower or just purple coneflower in our area because that's what's native. If you're in a different area, um, absolutely find out what's native to you. Um, but that's, that's what is native here. Linda says, does using Roundup hurt pollinators? Okay. Here is the thing about Roundup. Used judiciously, which means in small amounts, in a targeted way, no. And it, in the long run, it does much more good than it does harm. When you are uh, restoring an area, when you are trying to remove things like honeysuckle and buckthorn, you absolutely need to use something that will kill the roots. Otherwise it will just come back and it will come back angry. And honeysuckle especially is very bad for the birds. It leads to decreased nest success, things like that. Now that said, you should not just go willy nilly spraying Roundup all over your yard. That's not the way to do it. When I am treating honeysuckle and buckthorn, I am using a small disposable paintbrush, dipping it in a little bit of that herbicide and painting it on the stump. It doesn't get anywhere on the surrounding areas. It doesn't get on any of the surrounding plants. It really should not have any impact on pollinators at all, with the exception that it's getting out the bad stuff so that the good stuff can then come in. It's a very important tool in our toolbox when we are doing restoration because it's a way to remove the bad stuff so that we can get the good stuff thriving. So that is my little lecture on, on Roundup. Uh, glyphosate is the, the chemical name. Roundup is the trade name, sort of like when you have a medi medication, you know, it's got that long complicated name and then it's got sort of like the cutesy name like Claritin or whatever. Um, glyphosate is the chemical name. And if you use it according to the label, if you use it judiciously, it is a very beneficial tool to have in our toolbox. Uh, Danelle says the mosquito water, it's, uh, yeah, so you got your bucket, you got your water, you got your straw or some, it's something for them to land on effectively. So water, straw, and your mosquito dunk, that's all you need. And then keep it kind of away from where you are 
it'll bring them in, it'll kill them all. Um, let's see, how to get rid of yellow jackets. We have an overabundance of them and they're eating all of our caterpillars. Um, yellow jackets are hard because they are ground nesters. Um, obviously keeping any, any food sources away like garbage cans or things like that, you know, re removing or covering up those so that they can't get in. That's, that's one way to help deter them from an area, but being ground nesters, it's really hard to get rid of the entire nest, um, you know, without using a chemical down there. Um, I will admit I am not totally versed in that because it's not something I've, I've really done before other than using a chemical to get them out of an area where they are a threat to human safety. That's, that's kind of my big thing is you want to be safe in your yard. If you've got them nesting in an area that's adjacent to where kids are playing, where, you know, people are likely to get stung, then yeah, you, you got to deal with them. And, and they do make chemicals that you can put in those holes to kill off those nests. Hate to do it, but when it is a threat to human safety, it's kind of what you got to do. Um, let's see, can bird feeders coexist with a native plant pollinator garden, or is there a reason to avoid the feeders? Typically, yeah, you put your bird feeders out. I love my bird feeders. I love bringing in birds to my yard. I have lots of native plants and things for them to eat in the spring, I, but I also have the feeders out as well. The, the caution on that is right now there is some disease going through birds and scientists have not figured out what it is yet, at least not that I've seen. Um, and so they're actually recommending bringing your feeders in, bleaching them um, with a dilute bleach solution to clean them, to kill any pathogens. Um, because there is some disease that is being spread around birds right now that's that's causing problems and they're not sure what it is. Um, so um, depending on what area you live in right now, that may or may not be a problem. It seems to be something overlapping the brood X emergence area, um, but I've heard it may be coming into Illinois as well. <sighs> See your local DNR or um, Audubon Society for further advice on that is about all I can say. Um, Danelle says, where can we get the info for the class you're hosting on Thursday? I'm not sure what class you mean. If you're talking about next week's webinar, um, watch our Facebook page. That information should be coming out shortly. I'm not doing anything on Thursday, but next Wednesday's webinar, um, watch our Facebook page for that. Uh, let's see, who to contact in Cook County? Nancy, send me an email if you are interested in Cook County. I will hook you up with our Cook County rep out there. Her name is uh, Lynn Kehoe and she is fabulous. So drop me an email and I will send you that. Um, Peg says, when you use Roundup on Honeysuckle, do you paint it on full strength or do you use it per instruction? Um, actually, well, it depends because they sell lots of different formulations out there, different strengths. With honeysuckle, you honestly want it as strong a concentration as you can get. I use up to about a 50% concentration on there, painted on full strength, don't dilute, because um, that's that's what it takes to get rid of it, unfortunately. Um, Hannah says the bird pathogen has reached Cook County also, Willowbrook Center, uh, Willowbrook Wildlife Center received two patients, they posted about it yesterday. Okay, I'm, I hadn't seen that, so thanks, Hannah. Yeah, so that's why I've got my, my feeders down right now um, as well. Um, let's see. Oh, Karen says, do you do fall cleanup, spring cleanup, cut back tall things in the fall, etc." All right, here is my advice. In fall, be lazy, be lazy. Um, lots of insects will nest in the hollow stems of these plants and that's how they overwinter. That's how they get through winter. So if you cut everything down in the fall and, and you know, haul it all off, you're getting rid of all of the babies for next year. So in the fall, honestly, I leave everything standing. If you've got to cut it back for aesthetic reasons, cut it to about 14 or 15 inches and leave, leave that 14 or 15 inches standing if you can. Um, and then everything else, drop it. Leave it right where it's at. And that's, they may still be able to overwinter in that too. If there's any eggs or anything like that in there, they may still be able to hang out there. Um, and then in spring, you want to wait till late spring when it's warmed up enough. I think it's like consistently over 50 degrees during the day is what they say, um, when the insects will be out already and, and moving on. So 
um, at that point, then you can cut down the dead stuff uh, um, and then haul it off. Um, so if you do have to cut it down, stack it somewhere, drop it on the ground, leave it on the ground where it is if you can, um, leave at least 15 inches standing if you can, um, and hopefully that will um, help give those insects a fighting chance. All right, we have gone over our time here, but I could keep talking for another hour if you all wanted me to. You all have really great questions. I do appreciate it. Um, if I didn't get to your question and, and you are dying to know something, please send me an email. I put my email there in the chat um, and I, I had it up on the screen. My email is also the one that you get all the emails from Zoom from. So feel free to send me an email with your question and I would be happy to answer them. So thanks everybody. Once again, we hope to see you back again for Magnificent Monarchs next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Hope to see you there and thank you all for sticking with us. So take care everybody In get out, enjoy the weather, enjoy those pollinators, get out and see those butterflies. Take care. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.